now we're getting to the final uh, part of the um, lecture, which is the, this thing called the t-test. The t-test is, let's say, the realistic uh, version of this hypothesis testing that we just uh, looked at. So far, we, done, we, we did this, we did, what we actually did was the z-test, so to speak, because we, did, we tested the z-score, right? So just as a quick recap, I said, you compute the z-score, and the z-score is something like, it's, again, how many standard deviations is the value away from the mean? And by standard deviations here, you can also use standard errors because the standard error is just a special type of standard deviation. And, and if the z-score was larger than two, for example, or than 1.96, or if it was to the left, if it was smaller than minus two or small, smaller than minus 1.96, then you would say, I reject my null hypothesis, right? You, uh, the p-value is one way to, to, to you, the p-value and the z-scores are equivalent, they're basically the same. Uh, so you can, you can actually do it by, by checking if the p-value is le less than 5%, or you can just check with the z-score. Both things are exactly the same. So this thing, what we did, was it's called a z-test, because we're testing the z. We're testing if the z is larger or smaller than specific threshold values that we determined, either two or 1.96, or minus two and minus 1.96 to the left. This is what's called the z-test. However, the realistic version of the z-test is the t-test. And I will try to explain to you, based on what we know about the z-test, I'll try to explain to you uh, what is the t-test. And it's basically the same with a small uh, adaptation. The z-score, however, is only valid when we know the true standard deviation of the population, which is basically almost never, if not never. You never really know the standard deviation of uh, the, the population. You know, all the way from the beginning, we started from the assumption that we don't know the population or that the population is very hard to, to, to measure. So if, we, so if we knew the true standard deviation of, of the population, then that would be easy, right? I mean, we basically have all the information in our hands, so we don't have to, to worry about anything. Uh, that's almost never, if not never, the case. What happens most of the time is that you measure the standard deviation from the sample, and then you use that to uh, infer the standard deviation of the population, right? We've talked about that a mil millions of times. You infer, you take the sample mean, you use that to infer the sample mean of the population. You take the sample standard deviation and you use that with a small adaptation, as you remember, you divide the dividing by n minus one, you use that to infer the population um, standard deviation, right? So basically when you do that, when you have this, this, this uh, estimated standard deviation, then the z-score doesn't really work that much anymore, that well anymore. Because the, the denominator here in this, in this formula, it is not fixed anymore, let's say. It's not, uh, it's not a concrete number that you know where it is. It's an estimation. So you're estimating something on the top here because again, you don't know exactly, I mean, your, your sample mean is an estimation. Uh, and, and, the, you know, and the part below here is also an estimation because you're estimating the sample standard deviation. So since, all, since both parts of this um, formula here are estimations, then the values vary much, uh, much more than they would with the z-score. So the only reason I started with a z-score was just to get the intuition of what it means to test the statistical score, right? The, this idea that you have this z that you know measures how far you are away from the mean, and then you compare that to some other z that you defined before, which would, could be like two or 1.96. Uh, and equivalently, you compute the probabilities and then you compare the probabilities, which is exactly the same. But the realist, realistic version of a z-score is the t-score. And the t-score is exactly the same. If you compare this back with the other slide with the z-score, you will see that they are exactly, uh, almost exactly the same. But I changed this symbol over here. This symbol now is an s, which basically means the sample standard deviation, while with the z-score, it was a sigma. 
which basically means it's the population standard deviation, which we all know. So we will never do this. We will always do this one. Otherwise they're identical. This is still the difference between the observed mean and the null hypothesis. And this is still the standard error, but it's the estimated standard error. And then the T table, again, we still have a table to do that thing, uh, but the T table is a little slightly more complicated um, because things get a little bit more, um, it, depending on the size of your sample, that the values on the T table will change. And this is what is called, this thing called the degrees of freedom. I will not get into, into details of what does it mean to have, uh, to have different degrees of freedom. But what, what, what's important here is that the degrees of freedom is the number of points in the sample minus one. And that affects the actual probabilities that you find in the t-table. So you can see here that the probability of the t-table is not only, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically in this case, uh, determines not only the, whether it's one tail or two tails. So that's why I told you that you have to define that because the probability is a different, right? You can see that the one tail here is always half of the two tails. So if you have a one tail probability of 50%, 15%, that's the same as a two tail probability of 30% because two tails means you have two sides and one tail means you only have one side. Uh, and then it, the, the only thing that, well, the thing that kind of like makes it a little bit different here is really the um, degrees of freedom here. I will go through this, but again, the same thing, you, uh, when you compute the T-score here, which is more or less the same as the Z-score, you're still computing how many uh, standard errors am I away from the mean? You're still computing that, it's exactly the same. It's only that it's a more realistic value because it's estimated and, and, you, and, and we always assume that we are estimating things because we don't know the population. Uh, so let's, let's think about this. Let's think about how this, so you can see here the intuition is the same. Let's think about how we would actually like compute a T value and then uh, derive a certain P, let's say a T score actually and then derive a p-value from this, derive the probability that that would happen, right? So again, it's the same thing. The farther away you are from the mean or the larger is your t-score or smaller if you're going to the left and it's negative. So smaller to the left or larger to the right, uh, the less likely it is to happen. So the, the more you walk away from the mean, let's say, the less, the less likely it is to happen. And so the probability goes down and down and down and down and down. So for example, let's, let's check this one. For a one tail test with 30 samples, and I, well, which is something that's quite, let's say, realistic, especially for you guys. Um, actually, I, uh, I, can, I just realized I did it wrong here. I, I circled the wrong thing here. So let me just fix that very quickly. So I fixed here the, the small red um, ellipse. So, Let's say we want to compute a one tail test, which is something that you guys, some, some or many of you will do. You know, it's, you have a alter, alternative hypothesis where I think something is actually larger or smaller uh, than the actual null hypothesis instead of just different. And let's say you have 30 samples, which is something that is also, I guess, realistic to you. So when you have 30 samples, your degrees of freedom are, are actually 29. And again, I'm not gonna go into details about what, why that is so, but the, the, this, this is what it means. Uh, it, you, that's all, all, always like how you, you're going to define that. You're going to just take the number of samples minus one. So you have 29 degrees of freedom. Your confidence level is 5%, let's say, because we defined that. And that's again, very realistic. So you can see here is a one tailed 5% probability. So that's, that's the column you're looking for here, 0.05 for one tail, right? And then you go down all the way here until you find the 29 uh, degrees of freedom, and that's 1.69, right? 1.699. Now, what happens here is, what does this mean? Well, this means that anything that is to the right of 1.699 is less likely to happen than that. 
And anything that's to the left of minus 1.699 is very, very unlikely to happen again because, because of the confidence level that you determined here, this, this 5% here. So this is where the 5% is. So anything to the right is less likely than that and anything uh, to the left is less likely than that. Okay, so I fixed the uh, values here because I got the degrees of freedom wrong, but now it's, co it's correct. So, so again, let's say we determine this, this hypothesis test depending on our experiment that says, well, I need to do a one-tailed test because I'm only interested in something that is, let's say, to do one, either uh, my alternative hypothesis is, is that the value is either larger than the null hypothesis or is, li is smaller than null hypothesis, so I don't, I'm not, I don't want to do a two-tailed thing because I know what my alternative hypothesis is. And, and I've, I've determined a confidence level of 5%. You can see this, what I'm saying here, uh, down here. I determined the confidence level of 5%. So again, what that means is that anything that's less likely to happen than 5%, then I will reject that because I will consider that as being, as being very unlikely. Then what we do is we check the table here, say, okay, one tail, and then I go all the way to the left here and I find 5%. So this is where it is, the 5% the one tail probability, which means uh, that I will, I'm only considering, I'm only, I only want to, to know, like I only want to reject anything that's less than 5% for one side or the other, not for two of them because it's not two tailed. Remember, we talked about this, one tailed or two tailed. In this case, it's one tailed. And then I say, okay, I, this is the column that I want. Now, what's the rule? Well, the rule is, is regarding your degrees of freedom. And again, degrees of freedom is 29. I will, we're not gonna go into details of why that is so, but you, you will always choose the number of points in your sample minus one. So since we have 30 samples, as we, as we can see in, below in, in red, we, see we, have a, we have 30 samples or we have 30 elements in our sample then our degrees of freedom are 29. And this is where I want to be. So then what I get here is 1.699. What does this mean? What does this value mean? This means that anything that's more extreme than this, so anything that's, that's, that goes to the right of 1.699 is a rejection. If, of course, you're interested in values that are larger than the null hypothesis, right? That's what you're testing for. You're testing for anything that's 1.699 or more extreme than that. That's a rejection. If, on the other hand, you are interested in the left-hand side of the confidence interval or of the, the, um, the distribution, which means you only want to know what's like le uh, less than the null hypothesis, then anything that's, any, any t-score that is minus 1.699 or less than that, or which means like more extreme, so it's less to the left, then that's also a rejection. But again, I, I don't mean these two things at the same time. I mean that it depends on whether you're looking to the right or looking to the left, but, never, but not both in this case, because we de determined that this is not a two-tailed test. This is a one-tailed test. So it's either only to the right or only to the left. And then, but then it's up to you, it doesn't matter uh, because the probabilities are the same, it's still symmetric. So it's either more than 1.699 or less than 1.699, but not both at the same time. If it was both, then you would, ha you would be looking at a two-tailed test. For example, if you still had, if you still wanted, uh, let's say 5%, uh, but you were doing a two-tailed test, then this is this column is the one that you would use and not this one, right? And, and basically, again, this is this this would be your t 
your T score, your T, your your baseline. Anything that's uh, more extreme than that, either to the right or to the left, is a rejection. And and in this case, uh, we're not really computing the probability, the p value, but there is also a way to take the. Well, I mean, you take this one value t, and then you can also determine the probability out of that. But in this case, we're not really uh, caring too much about that. All we care here is that we have a, we have actually the baseline. Let's call it like the t star. Uh, we have the baseline, and then everything that's more extreme than that, either to the right or to the left, is uh, a rejection. Uh, and and he, this is this is one. Uh, so, so basically, that's this. Let, that's it for the theory so far, so so to speak, about the t test. It's exactly the same, or almost exactly the same as its z test. But then it has this this slightly little different uh, way of actually getting to the final probabilities because of how this this degrees of freedom actually work. Uh, and and let's go then. Let's let's then take a look at like this this concrete example. This this comes from Khan Academy. Um, Rory suspects that teachers in his school district have less than five years of experience on average. So he decided to test this null hypothesis that the mean uh, years of experience is five versus the alternative hypothesis that it's actually less than five. So let's, let's go through this uh, uh, quite slow in order to, for us to keep our minds you know, uh, in the problem. The null hypothesis here is five, is equal to five. Then remember, we've talked about it a million times. The null hypothesis is, is always like one specific value, equals to equal to five. But his his idea, his alternative hypothesis, is that this is actually less than five. So he's not only he's not only interested in saying it's not five, but he actually is interested in showing it's less than five, right? Uh, and then he takes a sample of twenty five teachers. So his sample size is twenty five. It's less than thirty. It's okay for a t test to do to do it with a sample of uh, less than thirty. His sample mean was 40 years. So, okay, he went there, he went out there, he did his survey, whatever he did with this, this 25 teachers, and the mean was four. As we know, the mean itself, the mean only itself by itself is not enough to reject, right? You cannot just say, oh, it's four, it's not five, so, and it's less than five, so I, it, done, right? No, because there is a lot of variation and we need to account for these variations. So we take the standard deviation. So his sample standard deviation was two years, you see? So that's interesting because think about it, right? Uh, let's think about the empirical rule here. 95% uh, of the points are between minus two and plus two standard deviations from the mean, right? So how much that is? Well, that is either four years plus two times two, which is eight, or it could be also five, four minus two times two, which is four, which would be zero, right? So actually zero years of experience, maybe it's the first year that they're teaching. That's also very, very possible, right? Uh, and so, so you see how this is not an, an obvious answer because four, because it's still you have this, this all the way between let's say four and eight to the right, which are still within the actual confidence level of 95%, right? So it's still, it could still happen. So it, so it could, could still be five, could still be six, could still be seven, could still be eight. Uh, and that would be like more or less agreeable with the null hypothesis. So you wouldn't be able to reject that. So what I mean is that uh, in summary, just because you measured four here and four is less than five does not mean that the, the hypothesis is rejected, right? There's always this, this standard, there's always this confidence level that you have to, to kind of uh, account for. Now, first of all, this is a one-tailed test. Why is this a one-tailed test? Because the, the alternative hypothesis is saying, I think it's less than five. I don't think it's uh, different than five. I think it's less. So I'm interested only in looking to one side of the hypothesis test, so to speak. It's a one tail test because I only, I'm only interested in whatever is uh, to, the, um, to the left of that, okay? Now, um, I chose a confidence level of 5%, right? 
And again, because this is realistic and this is what, you know, you guys would kind of uh, do and I, I don't care too much. Uh, the, the, the effects here would be more or less the same, but uh, if we did it with 1% or something, so um, this is more realistic, this is more common. So we go for the common one. Our degrees of freedom is 24. Why? Because it's my sample size is 25 and then we take 25 minus one and that's 24. So let's not get into why this is so, it's just so for, for us right now. And then this is a little bit of a summary of what we have from the actual text, right? The null hypothesis here is five. And just so you guys understand what this, this symbol means, this, this mu symbol means the population mean, right? Which we saw before, Greek letters are for population and uh, normal letters are for, like X are for uh, sample statistics. So mu here is population mean and zero means null, right? It's like the null hypothesis of the population mean. That's why it's mu and zero. So zero would, for Swedish, I guess it's easy, even easier to think about with that because zero is null, but uh, this, this, in this case, it was more or less the same for an English. This is my null hypothesis, five. This is my n, which is the size of my sample, 25. This is the x bar, which basically is the sample mean, the observed value. And this is the s, which is the sample standard deviation, the observed standard deviation. So that's why it's not a Greek letter. So it's two. These are all extracted from the text, text itself. So now we're just gonna compute the stuff. So t, it, this is the formula for t that we got here, right? So take my observed value four minus my, my standard deviation, this is minus one, right? So what does it mean that it's negative? It, if it's negative, then it's to the left. Uh, then this is divided by our standard error, the estimated standard error, because it's using the, the observed standard deviation. So I take S here, which is two, divided by the square root of N, which is the square root of 25 is five. So that is two divided by five, right? Uh, and, and basically when you do this, you get minus 2.5. So the T-score here, the T-score is minus 2.5. That means based on these computations, my observed, uh, let's say sample statistics are minus 2.5 or are 2.5 to the left of the mean. 2.5 standard deviation or standard error, sorry. 2.5 standard errors to the left of the mean. That's the, the negative just means it's to the left, doesn't matter. If it, it, if it was 2.5, it would be symmetric. So it would be 2.5 standard errors away from the mean to the right. But since it's negative, it's 2.5 standard errors away from the mean to the left. And then, okay, I'll say, I'll say okay, this is okay. I got a minus 2.5, but what does that mean? I don't know yet because I don't, I don't have yet the baseline to compare to. I, have a, I need a baseline of a T to compare to, to say, okay, if it's to the left of that baseline, then it's too extreme, I will reject it. If it's to the right of that baseline, then I say, yeah, it's not too extreme, so I can't reject it. So that, let's establish the baseline, right? We take a one tail test, we take the confidence level of 5%, we take, uh, and then we, this is, so this is the column that we want to use. Now we go down until we find 24 degrees of freedom, which we de determined that we have 24 degrees of freedom. And the value we have, it's then 1.711, right? Now, 1.711 is, let's say the, the value, but actually what we want is minus 1.711 because we want to go to the left, not to the right. This is a one tail test, remember? And everything that's negative is to the left of the mean. You just put a minus on it because it's just, again, it's just like uh, how much it's far away from the, from the mean. It doesn't matter if it's to the left or the right, this, the distance is the same, but minus simply means it's to the left. And then I, I, now I'm gonna compare. So now I have my baseline. My baseline is minus 1.711. Anything that's to the left of that, it's more extreme than that, I will reject. And just so happens that actually my measured value minus 2.5 is actually less 
than minus 1.711, which, which means it's to the left of minus 1.711. And if it's to the left, then that means it's too extreme. It's more extreme than the baseline. So yeah, the probability, the p-value here will be less than uh, less than 5%. And, and since it's less than 5%, then I rejected my hypothesis. And by rejecting my hypothesis, I'm saying the teachers in my school district have less than five years of experience. So you see how different, how that is different than saying the teachers in my school dis district have something else other than five years of experience. No, I'm saying it's less. I'm, I'm absolutely sure that it's less then oh not absolutely i'm five percent <laughs> 95 sorry 95 percent confident that the years of experience on average of my teachers in my school district is actually less than five years so i have rejected this this hypothesis that comes from some kind of uh of um understanding current understanding probably i think there was some other part here on the on the written uh, part of the exam where where it used to say that this value of five years came from some kind of uh, previously defined determined uh, data uh, and that would be like that would be some kind of a current knowledge and and as i said as i told you before every time you um kind of like compute this you, you, this null hypothesis comes always uh, from some kind of a current knowledge that you have. So there's there's some reason why you assume five years, like because it came from some other uh, experience or uh, not experience, uh, research. So, but we rejected that. We say in, in this district, actually, no, the the teachers have less than five years of experience on average, given the ninety five percent confidence level. Yeah, and, and that's it, guys. Uh, basically, that's what we had. That's what we have for uh, one sample t-test, right? Um, and and this is this is part of what you have to do. Some of you will perform a one sample t-test. Some of you will perform two samples t-test. So in, in the case of a two sample t-test, what happens is that you're not testing for a value anymore. You're testing for zero. You're testing for the difference of this, these two values is equal to zero. That's what you're testing for. And uh, so the two, thing, two things here will vary a little bit. So the, uh, there will be like the difference will be tested for zero. And also the standard error will change a little bit because then you have two variables uh, that vary at the same time independently. So the standard deviation and the standard error will change a little bit. And but I hope that we can build on, on, on top of what we already have so that we can determine the two sample tests, but that comes uh, a little bit later. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>